Hello fellow sojourners, welcome back to Appropriating the Culture, the only place in the whole wild world web that takes an unflinching examination of the hellscape we call 21st century America, and what we as Christians can do to improve, or at least manage, Western civilization. I'm Pastor Shane, I'll be your Sherpa today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So last week we began with the premise that external forces can make people more or less receptive to the gospel based on the condition of the soil. And a primary shaper of the soil is the culture, and the primary driver of the culture is art and entertainment, which are spheres of influence that Christians are largely and overwhelmingly not a part of. And the question is, why is that? To answer that question, we started with a history of Protestant antagonism. There is a historical apprehension between Protestants and the arts, whereas in Catholicism, some of the greatest works of arts were done by Catholics or commissioned by the Catholic Church, like the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo's David, and the lady who did Monkey Jesus. Hey now, that's offensive, and that's exactly what the Reformers thought as well. And the Protestant iconoclasts destroyed their icons, toppled their statues, and burned their paintings in an effort to rid themselves of idolatry and turn back to the Bible. Which is where we're going to start today, as ironically, one of the reasons Christians are not more involved in the arts stems from a biblical misunderstanding. Scripture clearly indicates that we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. Jesus says in John, I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. As a fallen people, we often fail in both ways. We are often of when we shouldn't be and out where we should be in. But Jesus in his prayer calls us to be in the world. He does not desire for us to live in seclusion and isolation like the Amish. No offense to the Amish. Actually, a little offense to the Amish. Not that you're watching. And if you are watching, welcome to the internet. It's a cesspool but a cesspool that Christians should be engaged in for the very fact that it is a cesspool and darkness is where light is needed the most. That's why we need to be in. Evangelism happens in. The Great Commission happens in. Discipleship happens in. And the cultivation of our cultural soil are all commands of Christ that must be expressed in the world. In, but not of. In, but out. That's what evangelism's all about. I'm a little hungry. The point is, if we are to be obedient to Christ, we must be living in the world. But the problem is, there's a natural fear that by living in, we will become of the world. And this fear has particular potency when it comes to the arts. Because the arts are such powerful influencers, Christians fear that exposure to them will corrupt. And that is, to some extent, a sensible concern. But if music, television, and movies can so powerfully reshape Christian minds, then that is precisely why Christians should live into those mediums to reshape non-Christian minds. See, the current thought is one of isolation and quarantine, which really fails to produce the desired outcome, and worse, it creates an unbiblical view of sin, which we might call the hedge theory. You might have heard the statement, build a hedge around it, which is an expression that promotes purity by trying to eliminate temptation. And in many ways, it's a sensible practice. After all, why flirt with temptation? Why put yourself in a bad situation? And putting a hedge around it does work. We've seen that with AA and NA and other groups that will remain anonymous. You like that joke, Bernstein? This could be worse than Watergate. Okay, but you can see it makes sense. It's safer. If you have a problem with booze, uh, don't even take one drink. If you have a problem with drugs, don't even do one line of Coke. That's probably good advice even if you don't have a problem with drugs. But we can see that the hedge theory has been successfully utilized in many ways. But it often leads to a fundamental misunderstanding of sin. And if you're listening to this on podcasts available now on Apple Podcasts and other places, I'll describe it for you. 
We have an androgynous man with an arrow pointing from him to a big red X. And in this case, the man stands for a man, and the X stands for sin. And since we do not want to sin, we don't want to go there, we put a hedge around it. Boom! Now there's a hedge between the man and the X. Not only do we not cross to the X, we don't even cross to the hedge. And by doing so, we can avoid sin. That's the thought process. Again, this can be sensible, but it can lead to serious problems as illustrated by the Pharisees who practiced this technique. They were so concerned with violating the law that they added new laws and traditions that would essentially put a hedge around it. It says in Mark, So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, Why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with defiled hands? Notice that the Pharisees are not citing the law. They're citing traditions. And much of their criticism of Jesus was not that he violated the law, he didn't, but that he violated their hedges. He paid no heed to their sensible policies and instead lived in and did things like eat with tax collectors and sinners. And they regarded Jesus as a sinner, not because he sinned, but because he violated their barriers. See, almost inevitably, over time, our sensible barriers to avoid temptation become regarded as sin itself. But Jesus corrects us on that misunderstanding. Back to Mark. Nothing outside a person can defile them by going into them. Rather, it is what comes out of a person that defiles them. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these come from inside and defile a person. Matthew, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. And the Apostle Paul says in Titus, To the pure all things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and consciences are corrupted. He says in Colossians, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom, with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. The scriptures are clear and emphatic. Sin is not external. Sin is internal. The biblical mode is not this diagram. The biblical model that Jesus teaches us is this diagram. And again, for those of you who are just listening to the podcast, I took the X that stood for sin and I moved it over the heart of the man. And it was a really powerful moment. I wish you could have seen it. But that is where sin resides. Sin comes from the heart. Sin is internal, not external. Now, temptation can often be external, which is why the practice of putting up hedges can be sensible. But when we conflate temptation with sin, we wander away from sound Christian thinking. And speaking of sound Christian thinking, our sponsor for Appropriating the Culture Today is brought to us by apples. Apples! No, we're not responsible for the fall of humanity. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. It could have been an orange, maybe a banana, but definitely not us. Apples, buy them at your local grocer and shout culture at the cashier to get 10% off your Fuji, Red Delicious, or Granny Smith's. Apples, yum! When Paul derides those who say, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, he, he might as well have added, do not watch, do not listen. And as he says, that might indeed have the appearance of wisdom, but it does nothing to restrain sensual indulgences because it fails to recognize the nature of sin. Sin is not stimuli. It's not what goes into our eyeballs. It's not what goes into our ear canals. That is not sin, unless it's a Michael Bay film. No, even then, sin is not external. Sin is internal. And all joking aside, this is important because if we conflate temptation with sin and begin to view sin as external, then it is impossible for us to live in the world. If sin is external, then the only solution to avoid sin is isolation and quarantine, which would make the Amish right, and you'd better start learning how to churn your own butter. But as we've seen in Scripture, Christ does not call us to quarantine, but to live in. 
And we can safely do that by wearing special Jesus masks, which coincidentally I am selling on my website. I do recommend buying and wearing three, one for each member of the Trinity for fuller protection against sin. And if that sounds ludicrous to you, it's because it is. No, we can live in the world because Jesus addresses the actual problem by giving us a new heart and a new spirit. The answer is not lockdown and quarantine. The answer is inoculation and immunization. His spirit is our vaccine so that we can live in the world without being corrupted by it. Now, we do have to work on it. It's not immediate. But as we work and as we grow in our sanctification, we become more like Jesus and are then better capable of living sinlessly even in a sinful world. The spiritual disciplines are our inoculation against the world. Being in the Word, dedicated to prayer, giving and tithing, living in fellowship with believers in church, serving and co-laboring, worshiping and praising, that's our lifeline so that we can live in without being of. But how does this relate to art and entertainment? Well, the biblical misunderstanding of sin leads to an avoidance of secular art. Many Christians firmly believe that reading certain books or watching certain movies or listening to certain music is an act of sin. But that is to suggest that exposure to external stimuli is sin. And as we've explained, sin is not external. God, who is without sin, has been exposed to all of it. He knows every line in every book. He's seen every movie ever made. He's heard every lyric that ever was or ever will be. And yet his exposure to it has not made him sin. It is our response to these things, not our exposure, which is either righteous or unrighteous. Now, of course, there could be a sinful reason as to why one is exposing themselves to such materials in the first place. Some exes, particularly if they're in a set of three, should be avoided. The fact that all things are permissible does not mean that all things are beneficial. We should be prudent and exercise wisdom in these manners. And don't think of yourself as better than you are. Temptation is real, and temptation can be external. Be wise. However, like all fields of study, exposure is a necessary component for learning. And if we are to be masters of anything, we must be students first. Every master producer of art was first a consumer of art. So if we want to be good producers, we need to be good consumers, which means that a lack of exposure results in poor craftsmanship. If you've ever suffered through a Christian movie, you know what I'm talking about. Poor craftsmanship. Let's face it, in general, a lot of our art and entertainment is not up to par. And why is that? Uh, why do we have worse quality? Well, in part, it's because of what we were just talking about. And let me explain it with an analogy. To understand this concept, let's suppose that a football coach only watched game film from Christian schools and Christian universities. Would we suppose that such behavior would result in quality of coaching or success on the field? Of course not. But that's precisely our approach when it comes to the arts. If you're listening on the podcast, that was... Nothing happened. Our ideology basically prohibits us from studying the game film. See, there's a connection between producing and consuming. If we can't consume art because we're worried about sin, then we'll never be good producers of it. We're not studying the game film. If you're not learning the techniques of artistic expression from the most skilled people working at the highest level on their craft, then we shouldn't expect success or quality. The arts are a highly competitive field. Uh, to put it in perspective, there are more professional football players than there are working screenwriters. There are more professional football players than there are working directors. That is how competitive a field it is, and to be able to compete in that marketplace demands our utmost. Well, next week we're going to be looking at other issues we have as Christian artists, particularly in the realm of film, so be sure to join us for that. In the meantime, rate and review our podcast, like, subscribe, and follow us on the major socials. And if you have questions or comments, you can reach me on my author's page, Nathan Shane Miller, on Facebook, at in Shane Miller on Twitter, and at NS Miller on Locals. I will address all questions on a later episode, and if I don't receive any, I will just make them up, and they will be silly. Well, that's it for now. Go appropriate some culture.